Today was a tough day for little Timmy at school. He got his head flushed by the bullies five times consecutively during lunch. Lost his prize burrito. Now has a permanent fear of specifically creepy men coming in at night and stealing their eyeballs because they're terribly fun and exciting exercise. And that was exactly 26p less money than I had before. But they do eventually head back home and see new notification from their absolute favorite and extremely handsome YouTuber. They've inadvertently created an intense parasocial relationship with. And they just did a video and reflushed. Wow. But wait. He recalls from some random stream that he didn't want to make a video reflush because they hated it. So clearly this is now a hit piece, adding a final piece to a terrible- Okay, this is a dumb bit. Look, this may come across as weird, but I have rules for this channel after a certain video, for a certain mod, got shown to the wrong audience. I may have inadvertently permanently soured a reputation for a mod with an ungodly amount of effort put behind it for, well, really forever? Whoops! Anyways, because of those shenanigans, I don't really want to portray mods in a negative light anymore. Which is why I haven't really made a video like that since. I only comment on mods I don't like if needs be, but I only really comment on relevant points of my conversations, and more so to show that I do know about them. And, well, if there ever was a poster child of that, it would be Reflushed. Reflushed is a mod made by so many people, that there are more people working in it than Mod PZ2 last I checked. But with various leads in PMix, PBZAB Fan, Slimaku, Cosmic Cookie, and whatever's, this mod is created as an expansion onto the original game, aiming to add new content and patch up bits and bulbs from the original to make the experience better overall. Its links will be in the description if you want to try it out, which I do strongly recommend. Now, for total transparency here, I was close to making a Flourish video about two to three times at this point. I have plenty of issues with the mod, ranging from misunderstandings of how plant rolls work, a huge amount of content that is exclusively time limited, and a notoriously questionable at best level and world design, well known among parts of the community that I am part of. Seriously, when I look at a level like Monday 49, I don't exactly look at it with joy in my heart. And that's an understatement. And don't get me started in the Wild West expansion. That expansion alone almost created two of these videos, and I really want to tear it to shreds, but no. Not today, nor anytime soon. Ultimately, these issues I have arise from my experience. And ultimately, I want people to get into mods. You won't know the things I do about reflourished flaws, because more likely than not, you have not played those other mods that form my experience. I strongly recommend playing reflourished yourself if you are at all interested in PZ2, period. Not just interested in mods or fan games, but in the fact that it actually aims to continue the parts of PZ2 people like. It's an important mod to a lot of people, and they have never had any aim to discourage you from playing it. All that to say, well, when I say Steam Ages is good, I mean it. Though I do mostly mean the second half, the first half is certainly a weak spot. Steam Ages Part 2 is the first part of Reflourished I can straight up look at and consider actively fun. Else when Reflourished I have to make my own fun. Except during Frostbite Cave's expansion specifically for reasons that one day I may cover. For Steam Ages Part 2 though, I fully feel like I can let go and just enjoy my time, which is certainly a nice change of pace. Despite how negative this video will get, I have a lot of criticism here, my main goal here is relatively simple. Showcasing what mods have become for people out of a loop, and for people who want to make their own mods, discuss various elements that need to be looked into during the process of making a new world. So, without further ado, let's get that world explained then, eh? Oh, and, uh, spoilers. I don't know if you care about spoilers or PZ2 world, but they will be here. Just saying. Sea Mages is a Chinese world poured over to a flourish with a new gimmick. New zombies, reworked plants, and other nice new things. Its main gimmick is focused on sewers, which throughout the level can spawn backward zombies. You can't plant on them except for various wall plants, and these sewers can spawn all basic types and imps. Specials in this world include Gentleman Zombie, who will fly over all non-sunflower plants, Barrel Zombie, a newspaper-like, Coal Miner, a zombie which will drop coal on the cart's death in the two adjacent lanes, Furnace, a zombie which will explode on death with a fire weakness and a cold resistance, Mechanic, a zombie which will flood the lane with tanky and speedy clockwork zombies. Inventor, who will fly over all plants with an extremely tanky balloon. And Repair Imp, who will drop a large machine on death that will heal adjacent mechs and this one woman for some reason. Insert joke here. The plants in this world include vanilla peanuts, 
Cat Hill as a limited range homing plant which is taxed in essentially a big square. Vanilla, whom will sun the entire lane, for a longer time if the distance is high enough. Lily the Alchemy, which will occasionally throw armor piercing potions that stall their targets. Maple Mechanic, who will shoot a forwards bouncing projectile, and a rebounding projectile that deals heavy damage. And Lotus Roots, whom is just a shotgun. The minigame of this world is reverse engineering, which I don't think is ever set in game, with to prevent the backwards zombies from touching the blueprints, or you lose instantly. I want to make sure everything's understood, so I'm going to talk about each of these elements individually. But where to start? I mean, we have seven whole special zombies to cover. Which one could possibly be the most important, and worth dedicating an entire section to? Look, if you play this world, you saw us coming a mile off. Mechanic Zombie, as stated before, creates Clockwork Zombies. What I didn't mention, though, was his stats. Mechanic has 3,000 health, almost as much as a full gosh dang gargantua. And the Clockworks he spawns are no slouches either. Each of these has a full 900 HP, or in between a Conehead and a Buggethead, and moves extremely fast for a basic style zombie, with double ETBS as well. These also spawn at Column 7, and will spawn every 15 seconds. Fun fact, do you know how much damage a Pichu does in 15 seconds? It hits 10 times for a clean 200 damage. When a mechanic's on a lane, you need to do 4.5 times P damage just to clear the Clockwork Zombie before the next spawns. Which, if you hadn't clicked yet, is a lot. This guy is one of the most dangerous zombies in the entirety of Reflourished up to this point. He is an absolute piece of crap who wants nothing more than to flush your head down the toilet five times and give you a trauma about a creepy man coming in at night and stealing your eyeballs. So yeah, he's kinda cool. Kinda. It's complicated. I think the main element of the mechanic worth mentioning here, and the main reason he has his own section, is a minor footnote in how his ability works. Unlike something like King, Mechanic Zombie has an incredibly dangerous synergy with the other most dangerous zombie in this world. Himself. He can stack with himself, unlike King and other zombies like him. Two mechanics can make clockwork zombies in the same tile if you don't kill the first one quickly enough. But it's fine. It's not as if a second level they're using spawns them four times from wave 7 to 10 in a two flagger level with a dangerous gimmick or anything. And especially not in a spawn pan where, yes, they can absolutely double up on each other, and it wouldn't be remotely difficult for that to happen. And in fact, more likely going to happen than not. Side note, level 20 is hit the highest level in the world by many, including myself. I wonder if a certain zombie contributes to that at all in a significant way. Jokes aside, stack mechanics of a murder button. They are the single scariest thing a Steam Ages level can show in your face, and honestly most levels in general. It's to the point that you need to be prepared to deal with them whenever they spawn. Especially when, for a zombie I would genuinely consider as about as dangerous as Gargantua, if they don't die immediately, they spawn a ton in Steam Ages levels featuring him, which just so happened to be most of them. Mechanic is used in every single level post-introduction, bar exactly three. He shows up a ton in his world, and in almost every level, is the main character. You know movies have that one character on a poster played by a famous actor, and just utterly shove it in your face? Mechanic is that guy. He's on every piece of promotional material. He's in the trailer all the way through. He is the face of a movie, or in this case, the world itself. Which isn't necessarily a terrible thing. See, Mechanic synergizes incredibly well with every other element of a world. He's an incredible support zombie, which means he works very well with every other special in the world. Or at least the ones I care about. Furnace gets the best wall it could possibly ever want. Coal Miner is guaranteed to throw coal on, at minimum, Column 6. This is genuinely great synergy. And even zombies like Gentleman Repairimp are absolutely not complaining about his help. Plus, they even work well with sewers. Steam Major's main shtick is field control, a war for space, where Mechanic is both a zombie that takes up two tiles on the lawn, but also produces a lot of zombies to reliably screw over a large chunk of said fields, which helps make Mechanic overuse not completely unwarranted. And this is to completely ignore that, visually, Mechanic is completely fantastic. 
As someone who has animated a plant by themselves, I can confirm the amount of work put into this thing is immense and completely insane. So having it be used so much isn't exactly unjustifiable. However, this does not change the fact that the levels without mechanic are some of the most important levels in the entirety of part two, as they are forced to rely on other enablers instead, which makes them far more interesting and a very nice variety. I do think Mechanic is a good zombie in the world, which allows a lot of shenanigans to occur, but I think is indeed a suffocating presence on the levels themselves. I think if it were spawned less in some of the levels they were in, this wouldn't be as huge of a deal. But this overuse is extremely noticeable, and probably the biggest misstep around part 2, but hey, at least it ain't Jester. And like that, I've already written a crap ton about a single zombie! Be glad I don't plan to write as much about all of them. In fact, I can consolidate most of them into a single section. The Eternal Dingus Parade! Because to be blunt, they aren't nearly as important or interesting. <laughs> These are the zombies I don't have nearly much to say about, and are generally background players and LZ appear in. Think of them in the same headspace as something like, say, Bug Zombie, or Dota Rider, or Explorer. They have abilities, but they tend to simply be there, and are defined usually as a supporting cast. Hardly noticeable, but they are technically there and worth discussion. Barrel Zombie feels slapped in, to be honest. He fits the world fine, but in the same way that adding Barrel Roll to Wild West for a single level to push a spike with endangered plant level works fine, his traits aren't specific to the world, and they certainly aren't distinct or interesting to play around. Realistically, the only unique element about Barrel is how his damage works, where it's always double that of a basic, enraged or not. Though this really doesn't play in the Steam Age as much at all. The closer you get is that it somewhat counts as melee, but that's a stretch at best, and even then, that doesn't feel like something you need to barrel. As Coal Miner, Inventor, to an extent, Furnace, and so on already do that. He is one of the first battles in the world, but it's very telling that for a huge thing apart too, he is just straight up gone from the zombie selection. And I do mean a lot, his disappearance looks like this for some reason. It's odd, but he also shows up an ungodly amount in part 1, where he does show up in every single level post his intro, except for level 15. He doesn't exactly make the world any worse, but he isn't making the levels any better by his presence alone. To the next super dingusy zombie, Inventor. I'll be honest, Inventor just kinda got shafted, just generally. The way their stats work, they are essentially a flying brickhead with a weakness to Magnet, Blover, and Poinsettia, instead of Chili Bean, Mines, and most walls. It's to a point I don't really have much to say. They can sometimes work as an enabler repair him and furnace, but will lack synergy for former is a bit frustrating. But it can heal them while they're on the ground, because armor can't be healed yet they were still included on the list, despite the fact they must have known it wouldn't work in the air. In other words, the exact reverse of what the interaction should be, which is dumb and I hope gets fixed. Otherwise, there's not much to say about them. They also have a lot of overlap with Gentlemen, a similarly flying zombie with the HP of Conet. Unlike Inventor, they are far faster, and will also stop flying to eat Sunbrucers. Considering the most used Sunbrucer is the one with a low HP, this is actually shockingly dangerous, and Day 30 in particular made great use of his zombie. He works alright with backward zombies to give him a bit of protection, and he has deceptively high HP, the point he can catch you of guards. Having Conate HP for a zombie like this is genuinely a lot more than you'd expect, and being able to screw up a sunflower field is a shockingly relevant ability. He's a zombie that has grown on me, mostly to part 2 using him much better than part 1 did. Though, I will briefly bring up his audio as being actively terrible, and sounding so out of place I refuse to play Steam Age with sound effects on. It seriously roughs us times. Bloody plan. While with Barrel and Inventor, I think the world could totally function fine without them, Gentleman is a very solid rapid threat for the early and mid game, and combos quite nicely with the two main enablers in the world, Coal Miner and Mechanic, both letting them get much further without taking damage, and allowing them to make a final mad dash towards the end. He isn't usually a huge problem, but he often threatens a problem. Repair Rump is much less dingusy, but way too late to really feel like a full part of the world, to me at least. While Barrel only felt slapped in, Repair Rump literally was slapped in far later in development, 
which you can somewhat feel in the game as in terms of the world itself, his utility is, well, somewhat questionable at times. In terms of targets he can heal in Steam Ages, there are four out of about nine specials if you count the sub zombies. Inventor is among them, who is more so an error, so I'm gonna cut them out here. Then you get Clockwork Zombies for my mechanic, but those have most of their HP and armor, something that repair him cannot heal whatsoever. So he only can really heal the last 300 HP. Might have to be somewhat challenging, but usually the extra distance doesn't result in too huge a loss. And himself, though he has a hard counter and magnet that can instantly kill him, and provides tons of utility against other zombies. So if this ever really becomes a problem, you have a direct counter button against Repair Imp and Repair Imp. This leaves exactly one zombie it can heal, which can prove to be a serious issue. Furnace. But even then, the synergy can sometimes be dubious at best. Don't get me wrong, it can be a danger. Furnace getting a little further is genuinely a huge fear, and the station heals 400 HP every two seconds, so you really need to overpower it. But... Then you remember that fires deal extra damage to Furnace Zombie, and denies Repair Imp his ability to drop his machine entirely if your defense is fire based. On the other hand, though, that's putting way too much focus on his healing ability. The actual danger is that he is a zombie that, on death, will kill the plant he was eating and drop a gravestone with 1000 HP that can also sometimes heal the zombies around it. Yes, 1000 HP, on top of his already pretty darn high 500 HP he has himself, almost that of a Conet. For context here, Importer only has, assuming you kill it before it goes into a gold tile, 850 HP total, with a pretty good chance to lose a backpack entirely. Repair Imp has almost double this amount, and will basically never lose the machine. Needless to say, Repair Imp can be a problem, but I do genuinely feel more so because of raw stats than the actual main ability. I don't like him that much to be honest, but he doesn't make the world worse by being here. I just don't think he adds all too much, and as a special account is currently at 7 zombies who are at most, at least relatively dangerous, I feel like he can be cut without losing much at all. But he does only show up at 5 levels, and he does make his presence useful in a few of them to enough extent that I can't really complain about him. He does do his job well enough, but I think he does contribute to something I'm going to cite as a global problem with his world, and you might have noticed it already. Mechanic has 3000 HP, Inventor has 2400 HP, and Repair Imp has 1500 HP total. Even the lighter, more spammable specials have Conehead HP in Gentleman, or Buckethead HP in Barrel. This world is tanky, and while I don't think this is inherently an issue in itself, it can cause some issues with the world as a whole as a result, so it is important to discuss. And, after all, Coal Miner has some words to say about it, too. I think describing this world's playstyle as similar to a siege is for the most part, wholly accurate. Everything in this world is tanky and, quite simply, won't die. Mechanic alone assures that much. I already said he is a face of this world, and I do seriously mean it. He is a hardcore defensive stronghold. His entire gimmick is centered on the fact that they are so defensive in nature that they become an offensive threat to fight against. And if you give him any time to work with, your defense will crumble quickly from attrition. Of course, it doesn't help that the world is already considered extremely spammy, and while spam isn't exactly the source of this feeling, it is nevertheless accurate. Even without mechanics, this world has so many high HP threats that have a very nasty habit to stack up fast, and walls are heavily countered throughout. Mechanics spawning zombies close so walls are constantly being chipped, coal miners and furnace dealing constant pressure for letting them get close to those walls, gentlemen and Avengers rate of ignoring them, and repair him acting as a mini furnace to the walls he is eating. All this in a world where you also need to be using those walls to deal with the backward zombies, often sacrificing other plants and a slot to do so, which constantly puts this world's front line under extremely heavy pressure. All that to say, the main answer to this world is instant damage and other stalling instas. And between a certain mechanic and furnace, those instas will often have to be managed carefully to win. Between backward zombies, Furnace is almost in range to blow up everything. Mechanics tanking too, and spawning in shockingly high numbers for a threat level, 
the fact that most specials in this world are too tanky for most attackers to reasonably deal with. Your lightning reads are worse than useless here, let alone most PSR AoE. It's a lot to deal with, but in a way I do personally enjoy. It forces a ton of constant pressure that feels very distinct to this world, but it does come with one big drawback. That's usually just it. The world leans hard into this one playstyle, but it leans so hard that the world can't exactly change its game plan quickly. There are two main zombies here that enable a lot of this world shenanigans, and both work strongly and almost exclusively in a CG style. Especially the first one you meet, Coal Miner, who pretty much proves this. Coal Miner's cart actually has relatively low HP, but the coal is thrown forward quite far. The coals themselves have 500 HP, and are immune to all knockback, meaning the only way to remove them is raw damage. It's an incredibly defensive zombie, relatively speaking to the kind of game PZ2 is, but is very dangerous as a result. It synergizes well with basically everything, removing some of the front line of chip damage, making it easier for zombies behind to slip by. But due to this overly defensive nature, he's not able to substitute as they rush down threats. Something Steam Ages is notably lacking, I'd argue. Don't interpret this as me complaining about him. Again, dangerous specials are what I love, and he works quite nicely in the context of a world, but it means that this world can't really toggle this playstyle off. Even in early levels where all you have is Gentleman and Barrel, this overall CG style of play is still felt, albeit to a far lower extent. Between the gimmick denying tons of valuable space, the zombies all being tanky and with high HP, or requiring something of high HP to do their job, and the general low speed of this world, it's extremely specialized to make levels this one way. And while I think the level design makes or breaks this world quite hard, we'll go that later, the way this world only has this mode of play is something I consider a problem for variety's sake. For a random example, consider a world like Big Wave Beach. This world is clearly built around a rushy playstyle, but it still has a ton of options to stray away from it. Zombies like Snorkel are self-sufficient and slow-moving, allowing for themselves to be used in different ways. Surfers can play in an incredibly fast way, with a large tide, or play in an entirely different way with far away tides, while Fisherman has a ton of potential to completely screw you over late game if he has even the slightest say in it. And that's for a world with just four zombies. Add a tank in and bam! You have a big wave beach that can now play the long game, and I save this from experience. In Ecclese, which is a different mod I plan to talk about later, the main addition to Big Wave Beach was Coral Cage, essentially a Pharaoh clone of 3000 HP, serving as a wall to force out a slower pace of play within levels, meaning that the world had several modes they could swap into, by using the gimmick in new ways, and swapping in and out certain special threats. It is one of my favourite worlds in that mod, as this variety is very well done, and makes the world very fun to play. I'm not saying every world should be like this, mind, but I'm saying that worlds being able to shift their gameplay based on what is there and what isn't is, well, fun. It's why other mods often use foreigner specials and levels, allowing worlds to show new size of themselves, and with 7 specials I do think a similar effect could be reached, with enough care and time. Though I will fully admit this issue I have with a world is, to put it lightly, not exactly damning. After all, this world has some really good levels I want to get into, and the world does have the best conditions possible for an extremely cool zombie to thrive, one that serves an important role within the world while doing it in a way that the rest of the world doesn't exactly try to. That being the one zombie we haven't really talked about yet, Furnace Zombie. Fun fact, you can tell that I am right calling this guy cool, because out of all the specials in part 2 that aren't the main character, Furnace is used the most consistently. Even the level designers must agree with me here. I kid, but Furnace Zombie does a lot of things right. For a start, he has the lowest HP in the world, at only 270. He makes up of this by his very dangerous ability, as on death he will explode destroying most plants in a 3 times 3 area instantly. He has some other specific details, some ways of killing him won't explode him, and there are ways to disable the explosion entirely if you know what you are doing, such as Chomper, 
stun based attacks, and so on. What makes Vanessa so fun to me is that they are a support zombie that needs support to support other zombies. Not only that, but they are extremely swingy, and are a great way to force progress against a defense where enough enables have activated, and when they do go off, they can support other zombies to allow them to get past that front line, to blow a hole right into the defense. This lends themselves to having tons and tons of new and stupid ways to get right up in your business and blow something up, in incredible fashion. Mechanics and Furnace basically kill Column 7 forever, and Column 6 is left under extreme pressure, ignoring the clocks with themselves, and allowing deeper Furnaces to occasionally fall through. Gentlemen diverse attention away from Furnace to allow it to sneak by. Call might add transitional walls for Furnace, and even Inventor can allow it to get far if in the right position at the right time. Let alone repair and that series of shenanigans. While individually these can be dealt with, Together as a united whole, it's a lot more interesting. Really, the only flaw I can find is the fact that it's in most levels post-introduction. It shows up a bit too much for my liking. I feel like in a world of 7 specials, about 60 to maybe even 50% appearance rate is probably optimal, and a few levels really don't require him. But this is by far not the worst case of it in this world. That would be mechanic. I don't think Furnace is nearly as dominating as Mechanic is in terms of the world at large. That's the final zombie to cover, and now we've covered the pieces of the zombie horde. Does it make you feel better knowing we won't talk about the zombies anymore? Does it make you feel worse to note that we've just talked about the zombies and some general world design, and still have to cover the plants, the levels, and the mechanic? This will took me about 4 hours to play, yet I still have this much to talk about which I think says a lot about the kind of person I am. We have yet more to talk about, so let's cover plants then, shall we? Let's talk about these plants in order, then. Cattail is the first plant unlocked, which is more or less designed to not be homing thistle, and that's certainly how it feels at times. It does about 2.5 times speed damage, and with its limited range is actually quite solid for early game. It can focus down specific threats on the field to ensure its damage can be quite good but would absolutely need support against bigger threats such as Mechanic, and against counter by threats like Coal Miner and Furnace, but it's one of the best counters, if not THE best counter, to the backward zombies in the world, but might be a bit too expensive to place on the front line. They work well in the world, but because of spam of backward zombies, you probably are going to be wanting quite a few of these. Vanilla is a lot more complicated, but also results in quite a lot of unreliability. It screws with a gentleman hard and has genuinely strong stall for targets towards the right of the screen, but they also drop off a cliff when zombies get within a few tiles, which is pretty damning in Steam Ages. It also does nothing in sewers, and in fact finds them a challenge to overcome as it really needs all the tiles it can get. It's at its best when you get mobile columns, and have an extremely high stun time as results. It simply does not get that space in Steam Ages often. Still, it is also far from bad in a single tile though it is in competition with Snoopy, which is fully reliable in comparison. The main thing Vanilla has over it in late Steam Ages is actually slowing down Mechanic a heck of a lot more, but beyond that, I do generally prefer Snoopy. Though stacking both is very funny. Outside of Steam Ages, Vanilla is far stronger due to the additional space, and in some worlds can completely shut down the vast majority of enemies, just as far future on the MSA Tour, which both lack ways to really get close quickly. In Steam Ages itself, it usually isn't the best pick imaginable, however. I'd say it's better than Lily of the Alchemy, at least. Lily of Alchemy is an interesting plant that, to be blunt here, seems a bit confused to me. It does like a lot of things, but doesn't exactly excel much in the world they are in at all. Think of the plant as a kernel pult that can pierce arm with his butter, and you have more or less the entire gist. Their projectiles do do the same amount of damage as cabbage, and the stall time is significant especially as in theory of average RNG, it is close to 100% stall uptime, which is not bad at all. Though Snoopy is a staller that does the same amount of damage with an AoE 100% chill, so you really need to be making good use of a potion's armor pierce, which is where things get odd. The damage of his potion explosion is actually incredibly high, dealing 100 damage cleanly. For context, that's enough to two-shot most basic targets, and as this is a pierce through armor, that is a useful threshold to note. However, they only do this attack once every 12 seconds on average, 
so we can kill armored zombies in about 24 seconds alone. On average, with bad math, because I'm pretty sure this is not how statistics work. Regardless, this means you're killing basics in the same amount of time as about 17 pea shots. Or, in other words, about the same time a pea shot they can deal 340 damage. Which gives you a good timeline of just how long this can be. Again, assuming average luck. A more apt comparison due to the sun cost would in fact be Repeater, which deals 680 damage in this period, leaving the only target on average Lily kills quicker being Buckethead. Not ideal. That is ignoring the fact that these projectiles also stall, so the zombie is stacked behind that first zombie, they are just gonna take a second potion hit, due to the stall effect unless they die quickly. This is also entirely ignoring the fact that, while a lot of enemies in this world may have armor, not all of them do. Most notably, Call from Coal Miner, the zombie Lily was meant to deal with. These calls completely clog up Lily, and ensure it just kinda gets stuck. And having only broadly about 1.3 times PDPS assuming average RNG? Well, you're not killing Conehead level zombies with much speeds, and are not helping in a fight against Clockworks at all, even while ignoring their armor. They just don't really do a lot in Steam Ages. They have potential outside of it, sure, whether or not zombies like Coal Mine to limited space, so it just seems like a poor fit to the world to me right now. It also just doesn't seem that effective as an anti-armor, it just results in this weird middle ground between Staller and Attacker. Though you can consider a more offensive Snow Pea, being with a Stalling and having a much better DPS overall, and occasionally giving you a cool high roll and murdering a bucket for free sometimes. It's a weird plan, but I don't know what to think of, but I do think it's misplaced regardless of his actual power. Oh, and by the way, plans should necessarily always be balanced in the worlds they are in, but because of the way PZ2 works, also known as, the world a plan is in is half the C packet, it's more important than it really should be, and puts a lot more pressure on plant own lock location. Let alone the simple fact that players are going to want to use a new plant they get, well, immediately, and use that as a first impression to base their thoughts on it off. This is the semi-quasi-weird stuff that only I ever think about, but it's something that's very important to bring up here for this criticism as a whole. Peanut is horrifically misplaced and does basically nothing in the world that other walls can't do better. In isolation, I do think Peanut is actually viable now, due to now being worth a lot more sun on both offensive and defensive sides. In addition to a huge 10 seconds recharge time, and a sun shell that can make repairing Peanut really cheap. The actual issue of plan is just... Its shooting element is kinda bad in Steam Ages. I already covered this, but this world is tanky as heck. Peanut does about 1.25 times peak DPS to 150 sun. That is just not enough. And this is ignoring the half damage when it gets eaten, which, spoilers, is gonna get eaten often. Against backwards threats, it just can barely chip away at them, no faster than a plan like Endurian does for half the cost. In general, you want to run a different wall of the peanut here, and I do think this slot could be better using a plan like Pumpkin or Wasabi. Pumpkin for synergy with melee plants like Lotus, and offering an alternate way to use melee to combat sewers and make space harder contests. And Wasabi, because the ability to hit backwards with high damage and range makes it a solid enough to a counter while being not bad against the front either. Food for thought. Maple mechanic is weird. It's a plant I'm incredibly neutral on in a way that I don't think I've ever been before. It's a plant where my dislikes come from the fact that, despite everything, Maypop is far too simple for its own well-being, despite seemingly being complicated. The backwards projectile rebounds after being fired, which sounds like a beastal trait, but in practice it doesn't really mean much. It'll hit anything to the right regardless, so while at first glance it seems like you would want to put this in front of sewers, there's no reason to non instead put them behind a sewer, especially as otherwise you're missing half the projectiles. Even then, this backward shot is actually weaker than a splippy barrage, albeit by the smallest of fractions, so I don't really think it's all that strong to keep zombies off the back. However, this projectile hits very hard, so it's not like the plan is weak at all. In fact, the plan still works in the world, as the bouncing smaller gear is very strong against the mages. Several targets have huge hitboxes, including some of the most dangerous threats in the world, which a small gear can easily bounce between. It has a hard limited fight of 6 targets, though, which is similar to the amount of damage a backwards gear can do. So the front projectile doesn't hit all that hard, but adds a lot of damage to specific threats, without the plant being overly reliant on it. To me, 
This plant is bizarrely too simple to use for the complications it has. It's best described as a more reliable bowling bulb in terms of usage, as it doesn't at all have a reliability problem, but to me also just makes an interesting plant. I don't like this thing personally because it attracts a lot from what made bowling bulb one of the plants I consider to have the best play style, so unique. But I have to appreciate that a lot of casual players are familiar with how to use bowling bulb. And if you look at it that way, it's fine, I guess. As a random aside, I think this thing might be overstated. It's not unlikely for it to hit most, if not all, the bounce cap most attacks. And without Bowling Bulb's reliability problem against tanky threats, it is insanely strong outside of Steam Ages. With just simple Insta support, it can really quite easily destroy most levels without much challenge at all. It being oversized is somewhat necessary for Steam Ages, I'd argue, but is an issue I can see being a continual one. In other words, Power Creep seems like it's already active which will need to be kept an eye on as the game continues, I wager. Lotus Root is quite simple in comparison. It's pretty much in the wrong world here, and not referring to how it almost looks like a war mural out of Mario 64. Pretty much every threat in Steam Ages has a way to bypass him or the walls he relies on to deal good damage, so his utility can be somewhat questionable at times. He does appreciate there being zombies absolutely everywhere, so he can hit max DPS often, but he struggles a lot to break through the tanks approaching in my experience, and especially for when he's introduced, feels like he needs a lot of extra support to truly work. Outside of Steam Ages, he is fine. His damage output is a lot more reliable in the early game, as he really wants there to be rows of zombies to ensure his missing isn't super likely, but even still, his range can be less than what he wants. In many cases, the effective range is only really about three tiles, for enough shots start missing that his DPS is less of a selling point. He's not usable, and up close he does actually have a really solid DPS, and with the promise ball installers, pumpkin, and other walls, he can definitely pull his weight. I do quite like using him. Hard to go wrong with shotgun. I do think these plants as a whole could be better utilized by the levels though. I think Lotus particularly notable, its introduction level in Sea Major's Day 25 is built around keeping mechanics alive and does a great job of showcasing how utterly hopeless Lotus is against them. It just doesn't deal enough damage to the mechanics to overwhelm them at all. But hey, that level of the sewer zombies in an interesting way at least. The mechanic of a world we haven't really talked much about yet. Well, considering how linked it is with a level design in this world, let's talk about it first, because the sewers are somewhat frustrating. I don't like this gimmick much. Conceptually, it's fine, but there's a few major sticking points that make this gimmick not my favourite to play against, and I hope to explain why. The first part, and the most complicated to explain annoyingly enough, is the way the game is balanced. See, Reflourished is pretty close to vanilla in terms of balancing. Vanilla plants rarely get significant changes, and when they get rebalanced, they tend to get general stat increases or decreases on stats like recharge, or costs. What they don't tend to get is damage increases. That's fairly rare. If you actually look at your potential backwards damage, you may quickly realize you don't exactly have a lot of it. At all. Homing Fist will turn sun, but only deals about 1.5 times P damage. Slippy does 2 times P damage, but is absolutely useless on the front ends. Plants like Starfruit or Rotobagger don't do great damage behind them either, and Sling P isn't exactly picking up the slack. This is enough usually to be fair. The false Steam Ages, the worst you have to deal with in the back is most likely low HP anyways. But in Steam Ages, there are buckets. And buckets are a problem, especially when they spawn right at the back and are almost immediately on your back line eating your plants. Sure, walls can stall them, but the levels tend to really like spawning a ton of buckets when they do appear. And if you're relying on something like Split P, you are likely doing little to no damage towards them. Unless you're running something like Tollnut, you're going to have problems with walls coming down too fast, especially if zombies start stacking, and you're stuck trying to kill a bucket head, or the basic behind it starts tearing down a wall and impede it. This becomes a bigger problem with my second issue in mind. They take up a space, and because they have to be neither back to do anything, you end up losing a lot of viable space of sewers. Even on a simple level like Day 17, you lose two tiles in the first column, and one in the second. And this is not uncommon. 
Even when nothing is spawning, your defense has to contour around them pretty hard. You need several tiles to deal with them usually, and while walls can be placed in the sewers, you usually need another tile to just kill whatever appears, which can hit your sun production really hard. It's also notable when this world is first like Coal Miner, Mechanic, and Furnace, who can heavily punish you if left unchecked, where losing just a few tiles can become a massive problem. And the sewers aren't used lightly either. They are often a huge threat in levels they appear in, especially in part one, and the levels will always put the sewers really close to whatever is going to push you the most. That being my third issue. This all just means the sewers can often become frustrating, especially if, like me, you appreciate deck variety. Here's a fun story. When I record footage of videos, I tend to rarely lose even when picking incredibly stupid decks. This is not because I'm such an epic gamer that I'm incapable of failure, because I'm incredibly used to playing in stupid ways. Like, very often I record Lost City levels straight shooter only against Excavators, but I still generally win. Might be a bit closer than I'd like, but it's rare I actually lose. Seam Ages is a big exception to this rule. I lose a lot in my footage, and the main culprit is that the answers to sewers tend to be very specific. And when I absentmindedly pick my dumb decks, these answers don't come up that often. And like something like lily pads or heating and by caves, these counters don't click as plants that you must bring, but if not brought, can cause losses all the same. The bigger problem to me here is that they also tend to mostly be plants that really define your deck. I'm sorry, but if you're bringing cattail when you have seven slots, like I do, you're going to need to focus on it hard, otherwise you lose out on too many slots and too much sun to deal with everything else going on in the world. The close to a one-slot solution I found is Endurian, but even that is comedically unreliable at best, and you still usually need a backwards attack to help out. I don't particularly enjoy this, at least in a vanilla style mod. The best world games in PvP 2 are the ones that inherently allow you to run more or less whatever damn hell you like, and if they punish you for running something else, it's generally something you can play around. Name Escape 2 does make you instantly lose to playing without slowdown effects, even if it makes it far easier. Wild West can be played without solid backline support for prospectors if you're good enough, even in harder mods. Meanwhile for Steam Mages, I don't really feel this applies, which is frustrating to me personally. However. That's all more so stuff I noticed on a replay of the levels in this world. On a first playthrough when you're just trying to win, I don't think it's nearly as prevalent. I think in part 2 the sewers also weren't nearly as annoying as part 1, partially due to vastly improved level design, but I think it's still a worthy criticism to point out. As a gimmick, it is indeed quite interesting, and can lend themselves interesting levels, so it's not a god awful gimmick, just not one I like much. And of course, I say it's also by the levels, which I'd say are, on average, pretty darn good. Levels are a factor of any world and are, realistically, the biggest thing that makes or breaks one. Because it doesn't matter if a world has the potential to be great, if a world itself can never reach that point. A world like Wild West and Vanilla has all the elements of a brilliant world, but the actual levels in Vanilla are pretty much wholly awful from start to finish. Ball Zombie only appears in, like, three of them, and the levels are all literally copy and pasted from each other, making Vanilla Wild West actively miserable to play. Of course, for Steam Ages, this over-focus on levels is worse, as Steam Ages itself is forced to be reflourished for, as you may assume, obvious reasons. For worlds like Wild West, other mods can adapt and improve on the lackluster Vanilla levels, but for Steam Ages, what you get is, more or less, all you're ever going to get. So it's a damn good thing the levels are the strongest aspect, eh? One of the most important parts of a level, in PvZ2 at least, is their ability to twist the world's mechanics to create new experiences from the same few pieces. Think of it almost like modding a game on a micro scale. Your aim is to swap around these predetermined pieces to make something new of them. Of course, not every level should be like this. You need to define the norm, after all but the levels that are special are super important to the world, and I feel like Steam Mages Part 2 understands that quite nicely. From as early as Day 20, it becomes quite clear they are cooking with fire. In a level that is arguably in need of a severe nerf, 
but is a fun challenge, using the world's minigame in a setting where it's not likely to kill you normally, but using mechanics to divert attention away from backward spawning zombies, and training you to pay more attention to the zombie spawns as a result. It's genuinely quite well done, albeit maybe a bit much. Day 29 makes this even more clear, using molds and this same minigame to create a level where you have to defend single tiles of walls against mechanics, coal miners, furnaces, and repair rooms, creating one of the most memorable levels in the entire world. These two levels to me in particular show something important to me, and attempt to diversify how these same level gimmicks are used together in a memorable way. Of course, these are both big, flashy variants of this core concept. There are smaller ones scattered around the world which do a lot of heavy lifting visibly. For instance, specials are used way more carefully for the most part, meaning that they aren't used every single level, mostly. Zombies like Barrel and Gentleman become only a sometimes threat, not an always threat, and means that levels can focus harder on specific synergies and making them work, which I do love. Day 27 is perhaps the best example of this. A level which quite literally only has two specials, Repair Imp and Mechanic. The level even has a Mana Trim pre-placed, so those repair machines are likely to be further right than maybe you'd want them to be. And of course, Day 30 is a level which uses almost every single underused threat in the world and flips them on its head, turning the Dingus Parade into a Dingus Army. A level that turns them all into actual threats in a really well thought out way which I do genuinely adore. But there are still issues with a few of these levels to cover, just to cover all my bases here. For a start, I'm not personally a fan of most conveyors here, and I feel that most of them just aren't particularly fun or interesting to play. They all boil down to plant spam, with very limited strategy being employed for any of them, due to a mixture of too many plants, too many specials, and just a general lack of interesting ideas among them. Whilst most people this probably is an issue, but I just don't find them satisfying to play at all. Though I am willing to overlook them, as these clearly were not meant for people like me. One thing I can comment on is Day 20 in particular. I don't like this level one bit. You open up the level and see Gargantua, Gentleman, Coal Miner, Furnace Zombie, Mechanic, and Repair Rump, and I hefty large don't lose X plan count. Now, gargs are fairly bloody rare in this world, so your first thought would likely be, oh, this is going to be a long level. It's a one-flagger level. Now, admittedly, it's a long one-flagger level. This thing is straight up long in day 17, a two-flagger level. I am not kidding. But it doesn't effectively communicate to the player what it's actually about. Besides that, the level doesn't really settle into any particular synergy, and instead just generally tosses enemies at your face in an unsatisfying way. It's probably the worst level in part 2 for me, as a result. There is still the overarching issue of zombie usage being a bit... interesting? It comes across to me as level makers just using whatever zombies they felt like that morning, so obvious favorites come across. See Mechanic for reference, and Furnace to an extent, while zombies like Inventor just disappear for four levels in a row before reappearing in every single level to the end. A lot of specials are like this, where they disappear for very clear and visible gaps before reappearing almost consecutively. I think having better zombie management would help future worlds out a lot. Here it's not a huge deal, because there are whopping seven specials, but in future worlds, better special management will become key. Unless they keep adding a ton of special zombies, I suppose. I personally prefer fewer, but meh. It's a style, at the end of the day. Oh, and the introduction to Inventor being fully focused on using Magnetroom to turn him into a non-threat is... certainly a choice. It sets up this zombie for failure, as the player meets a special at the exact same time as they learn the hard counter which stops the zombie from really doing anything. It just really sells the fact that Inventor isn't going to be doing all too much in this world, and I'm far from a fan of this decision. The level after already explores the interaction as well, and just removing Mana Shroom here would help establish the zombie better, I'd wager. Probably the biggest concern is more or less the entirety of Part 1. Part 1 of Steam Ages not only has less special than the second half, 3 versus 4, it forces the world to focus a lot more onto core mechanics of the world itself, 
and it just doesn't work for me. Sewers are fun and all, but when they are consistently the only major threat a level, and that's really all these levels have, I just don't think it works. In addition, the special usage is really bad here, as every single zombie appears in quite literally every level post introduction. In fact, the only zombie that doesn't consistently do this is Imp Zombie, who, needless to say, is not relevant. And Barrel Zombie takes a break for level 15, apparently. I don't know why. Still, this part 1 feels extremely repetitive, and doesn't really have any great standout levels. I do like Day 14, the Shovel of Subjective is quite neat, but the other levels don't do enough to be truly interesting. The minigame is introduced, but it's only the surface level stuff and doesn't really do a twist on it. There's a last stand, but the best zombie for that gimmick would be Mechanic, who is straight up not here. In fact, most of part 1 is just Barrel and Gentlemen, which I don't think are enough to do really anything at all, and really just highlights the sewers which, due to them being the only threatening thing here, do the exact same thing each time. This is probably a good point to mention here, that the order of zombie and locks is pretty rough as a whole. Gentlemen and Barrel are weak specials, sure, but don't do all too much between them to set the mood of the world as a whole. While I'm certainly not suggesting mechanics so early, I do think Repair Imp and Off Furnace, in the current lineup, could work in these early levels, instead of either Barrel or Gentlemen, or just moved earlier in general. As is, these early levels just aren't very interesting, and could do with some spice. Sea Mages Part 1 is definitely the weakest part of Sea Mages, and to me in short, showcases the importance of level design. Though I also do think it suffers because of when it was made. Sea Mages Part 1 and Part 2 were built at entirely different stages of development, the former when less level designers were on board, and the latter when it got a lot of people in to help out across the board and started seeing what people thought of the world. They can tell this from zombies here. Part 1 has no truly new zombies, while Part 2 only has one returning zombie from 2C. Regardless, Part 2 does a lot of things well, and I can only hope they'll use what they learned during development of Part 2 to make the next world better, and make a Part 1 that comes together far better. Both with better special placement throughout the world, but also with levels that aim to diversify the world's mechanics from the start, to encourage variety, to allow the world room to flex and prove itself better. If future worlds can do that, I think I'll be looking forward to future of Flourish updates, for the first time really ever. And to that, despite everything, my hat is off of the developers putting on a, in the true spirit of the world, a jolly good show. All that said, on my world tier list, Alpha Steam Mage is about here, which may seem somewhat high, considering all the complaining I've done about it. But here's the thing, in my honest opinion, you can't love something unless you, on some level, know that it sucks, as contradictory as that seems. Games are identified by their strengths, not their weaknesses. This is not something I'm going to argue, but what I am going to argue instead is that if you truly want to appreciate their strengths, you need to understand the mistakes and missteps made along the way. It took me a while to first start enjoying Reflushed. I'm going to be fully honest here, I have a whole list of negatives I could say about Reflushed. I could easily make a video twice this length about them and still find things I've missed. That certainly is not something that has ever changed for me. However, recently I've found ways to categorize a lot of the issues Reflushed falls into, and on some level, justify them. I think Holy Mashup is a pretty bad world, but upon rethinking, there are 12 unique sets of zombies in a 48 level world. I was never going to like it. A large chunk of levels in the expansions, and the expansions themselves, are pretty sloppy, but these were the early levels made for mods and don't accurately represent the rest. Even within those levels, the most reoccurring issue is an overuse of world gimmicks within those levels, which explains a lot of Wild West especially. Even for Steam Ages this applies, its issues come down mostly to special overuse, a mechanically weak gimmick, and some level design that needs touching up. These issues are not enough to outweigh the levels that are genuinely great. The plans which, even if I may not like them all, are genuinely unique, 
of the incredibly solid zombie selection. To me, at least, this categorization helped me a lot to find a Gunner Flourished. It's not a million issues all at once, it's a few persistent ones. It feels a lot less overwhelming to me when it's like that, and that helped me think a lot more positively about this mod. A lot more. Regardless, I do refer the mods, and always will, realistically. Uh, speaking of which, I wanted to end off this video not with further details about myself and the process of making this video, it was miserable, but a suggestion to those still watching to try the mod from time to time, or if you are still watching and haven't played the mod, to play the flourish itself. Every mod ever made has passion and hard work put into it. The fact that a mod even gets released is inherently valuable, and an absolute challenge to overcome. A small miracle in its own right. That's not to say that blindly love mods, or even like them. But here's the thing. The only thing modders get for their time and effort is the satisfaction of people playing what they made. They don't get paid for making it for experience, after all. If you have an Android device or access to an Android emulator, I strongly recommend the experience. And link below will be a guide on how to download the mod. If this overly long video hasn't convinced you that I do seriously care for this game's mods, maybe a bit more than I should, I don't think much will. Anyways, this has been Creeps, and have a good one.